Amen. And so we thank you, Father. We praise you, Lord. We know that every good gift comes from you. And so, Lord, we pray, Lord, that there would be power in this place, your power, your Holy Spirit would flow freely in this place, Lord, that you would speak to the hearts and to the minds, Lord, that we would be encouraged by your word, that we would be encouraged by what you do, Lord, every day in our lives. Remind us of the blessed hope, Lord. Remind us, Lord, that we are weak, frail vessels, but in you, Jesus Christ, all things can be done. You bring peace, you bring joy, you bring supernatural hope so deep within us, Lord. You put it so deep in us, Lord, that the world cannot even see, but they just laugh at what is truly in the heart of a, of a genuine Christian, Lord. I thank you, Father, for the work that you do. Your will always be done in this place, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 And so... The message this morning is entitled, One Who Serves God. Now, we as human beings are created to serve. It's either going to be the kingdom of God, Christ, or it's going to be yourself. And really, if you're serving yourself, you're serving the, 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 the flesh, and the flesh is submitted. The Bible clearly teaches that the flesh, our flesh, is submitted to the kingdom of Satan. And so Jesus does not believe in a middle ground. You know, Revelation chapter 3, Jesus says, because you're lukewarm, because you're neither hot or cold, Jesus Christ says, I will reject you. I will spit you out of my mouth. And so there's right and then there's wrong. There's left and then there's right. You know, uh, there's, there's no middle. Especially when it comes to what I'm talking about this morning. We either serve God or we don't. We, if we do not serve Christ, then we serve ourselves. And that you have to look at yourself this morning, how you are wired. Some of us know more about cars than we do our own self. We know how the engine works. We know how the transmission works. We know how everything is wired together. Even through the, the, the complex issues of today's vehicles with all the electronics, we still have a basic knowledge of some things. And so we know how a cell phone works. We know how iPad works. We know how to network and program things. We know how to do all these types of things. Knowledge is greatly increasing, but still, we are still ignorant of what, how we are hardwired on the inside, us. We, human beings, I don't care what religion you are. I don't care what race you are. I don't care how young, how old. I don't care. We are created by Almighty God with something that is so deep in our DNA, our spiritual DNA, that we are led to worship. We are led to serve. It drives us to that. And this morning, some of you are serving yourself. And by doing that, you're, you're ignoring the teachings of Jesus Christ. You're embracing the teachings of the world. Your, 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 sec, your thoughts are secular. Your, your self-agenda. And so either Jesus is a liar, a lunatic, or he told the truth. There is, no other, there is no fourth option. You have to really hear that this morning. Jesus Christ is a liar, a lunatic, or he was telling the truth. Now, you have to make that choice today. For me, I believe he is absolute truth. I believe he tells the truth. And so, therefore, I believe in the entire word of, of, the, of the Bible. It is not man's opinion. It, it is directly inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so, when we come to that conclusion about who we believe Jesus is, we're either going to be now led down a road to serve him or to continue to serve ourselves. Every day we choose whom we shall serve. Some serve money. Some serve greed. Some serve lust. Some serve being a liar. It, it, it goes on and on and on and on. And this morning, and I speak to many watching live on, on the internet, and whatever media device you're on, um, and also at a later time, one who serves God, it's going to begin with one thing, faith. Faith. Hebrews 11.6, you don't have to go there, I'll read it to you. Hebrews 11.6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, that's God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently 
seek him. Now, I will freely admit I have not seeked Christ all my life. For the past 12 and a half years, I have seeked Christ. But for many years, I was seeking the will of my own desires. And it led me to a place of complete loneliness, and darkness, and drunkenness. Such a vile place. But it was Jesus Christ alone, and probably through the prayers of some people in my life, who, who prayed that my, I would be blind so that I could see. You know what I'm saying this morning? And so this young man that had a wreck in front of our church and hit a tree, uh, 18-year-old young man who was drunk this morning, I, I, I was in that place at one time, and some of you were too. And you watching, you, you may have been that just a couple of days ago, t- touching something, doing something you shouldn't be. But what we serve, we clearly see the effects in our life. And to serve God, it is going to take faith. You're just going to believe it or you're not. You'll never understand how this world was created. You'll never understand the true mysteries of God Almighty. It's all by faith. It's all by faith. As a Christian, I can live in this world. And if I die as a Christian and I, realize, and I find out that this is not even real after all, what do I have to lose? But what if I live in this world denying this and then go into eternity and and find out that this was true? See, I have nothing to lose as a Christian, but I truly believe I'm absolutely convinced in the word of God. I am absolutely, absolutely convinced that God Almighty is the creator of heaven and earth. I'm absolutely convinced that Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father. There is no other way. I'm absolutely convinced about who Jesus is. I'm absolutely convinced that there's a that there's a heaven and that there's a lake of fire. I'm absolutely convinced that God's will is that no one be separated from him when they leave this earth. No one. I'm absolutely convinced that God created the lake of fire, not for any human being, but for the devil and his fallen angels. I'm absolutely convinced of that because Christ teaches that. I'm absolutely convinced that God has surrounded us with his love and his light, no matter how much places we have gone into dark places. He has never abandoned you. He loves you with a passion. And his plans for you are good to prosper you and to bless you. And so we must never forget that. But it's by faith. And the person that approaches that that with an attitude like that is one who serves God. They're one who serves God. Death has no fear over them. There is no fear. There is no confusion. There is no frustration. we, we, we know where we're headed, Christian. You know where you're headed. You should not be afraid of world events that are happening in the world today. Because you know what the Lord has said about these things. He says, when these things begin to happen, stand up, st- straighten up, lift up your head for your redemption draws near. Just like birth pains. I've been through several births with my wife. No, I didn't do it, but, you know, she gave birth. You know, but I was there trying to encourage her. The first one I really messed up. The first one I said, oh, it's a walk in the park. You can do it. And she was about ready to hit me with whatever she had in her hand. She was in labor 32 hours with Mariana. And with Mikey, he came so fast. I mean, wow. I mean, he just came right through into the world screaming and yelling. And so totally different kids. And so, and then with Gracie, you know, it was uh, just like Mikey. came real fast. And so, but um, I, I know what birth pains are like. They start off very slow. And then as they come down to the end, they're very fast. They're very rapid. They're, they're continually fast, run one after the other. And we see that happening in the world today with world events happening so fast, so fast. Do you realize how, how so many famous people have died in just this month alone in America? I mean, just like every day, somebody famous was just dying and dying. And, and it's just a reminder to me that, that death is a respecter of no one. But you see, Jesus conquered the, the grave. And death has no power over us. So it's by faith. It's by faith that we enter into everyday life with the right attitude. Now turn with me to Malachi chapter 3. I I would like to dissect this chapter because one thing we need to understand about the book of Malachi. Malachi is the last prophet to speak to Israel, to the world, and then there's 400 years of silence And then John the Baptist show up and Jesus Christ show up. You get what I'm saying? 
The, the, the book of Malachi ends the testimony of God in the Old Testament, but, but before Christ. It is the last time God speaks to the people. And then 400 years of silence. And I, and I believe Malachi is a, is a book that it could have a serious study. It speaks to the people of Israel in ancient times. It speaks to the people that were there on the earth as Christ walked. And it speaks to even the church and Israel today and in the future. It is a very prophetic book. It's a powerful book. And it has many life lessons. And the prophet Malachi was, a, a, like the rest of the prophets, were to be reckoned with. They, very, they spoke the very word of God. And now in Malachi chapter 3, I would like to read in verse 1, and it's called about the coming messenger. It says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Now this speaks in twofold. It speaks to the people at this time about the first coming of Jesus Christ. He's coming into the temple. You remember as Jesus came and he was in the father's temple? He was in the temple and he overthrew the money changers tables. He said, it is written, my father's house shall be a house of what? Prayer. You remember that, right? At 12 years of age, Jesus was found in the temple uh, learning and listening and discussing the word of God. He was in the temple. And it says here again in verse 1, it says, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Jesus did that. He did that. Now, the Bible also teaches that. Today, the church worldwide, whether you be Jew, Gentile, black, white, purple, green, yellow, it does not matter. We all bleed the same color. We need to understand that. Amen? Amen. We have to understand that. The devil is trying to create a race riot in this United States all over again. He's trying to do anything to bring division in, this, in these United States. And he's doing a very good job. But we're all the same. And we're all the same. But the church, the church today, the Bible teaches that the church worldwide is that, that temple today. That temple is not in Jerusalem. It's us, the church. We make up the temple today. And when Jesus died on the cross and he gave up his spirit, the very temple in Jerusalem, the curtain was torn from the top to the bottom. That, that was inside was the Holy of Holies, the very presence. It was the Holy Spirit of God. And when Jesus died on the cross, it tore open. There was a mighty earthquake at the foundation of the temple. And the rock split. And the Spirit of God went out into the hearts of all people now. And today, we are that temple. Today, we have the very presence of God. But we know today, just like the Jews understand today, and just like the church knows today, that Christ is coming again. Amen? So this speaks of the past, the present, and the future. And so it calls us to pay attention to what Malachi is about to say in some things here. Who can stand? Who can endure the day of his coming? Verse 2. Who can endure the day of the coming of the Lord? The book of Revelation teaches about the coming of the Lord, how it will be so great that when the sixth seal is opened up, that it says that men will go into the rocks and hide themselves and they'll say, save us from the wrath that is to come, the wrath of God and the Lamb. It's so funny how today in America so many people are uh, uh, bunker houses, houses in the mountains, houses underground are becoming very famous. You know what I'm saying? You can buy these homes online. They'll come and install them for you. You can store up food for years and years and years. It's funny how this is being promoted now in America because Revela the sixth seal in the book of Revelation says that that will happen. People will look toward their resources thinking they can ride out. A nuclear holocaust. Thinking they can ride out the war that is to come. The great war. But it's, it's the wrath of God. People say so many evil things are happening in this world. Why doesn't Jesus do something? Why doesn't God? If your God is a God of grace and mercy. Why doesn't he do something? He is. He's coming. He's coming. He's on his way. He sees the injustice. He sees the hurt. He hears the prayers. He knows your pain. He can identify with what you're going through. But it's the one who serves God who knows and understands and they can discern the season that we're in. And they know that we must approach this with a mind and a heart of being serious about praying, fasting, and truly living the gospel, not just reading it. Christian, you will be the only Bible people will ever read. 
by the way you live your life. And so in verse 4, it says, Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord, as in the days of old, as in former years, and I will come near you, and I will come near you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and widows, and they exploit orphans, and against those who turn away aliens, meaning foreigners. Because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Last Sunday, uh, I was talking about that is what's missing in American society. That's what's missing in the church today. Nobody fears the Lord. And I'm not talking about the type of fear where God's walking around with a hammer ready to hit you in the head. That's not the kind of fear I'm talking about. The fear I'm talking about is how Joseph, when Potiphar's wife tried to come on to him and sleep with him, Joseph said, I can't do this. This is wrong. How could I do this to my master? How could I do this to my father? How could I do this to my God in heaven? No. And he said no to sexual morality. And he ran away because he had the fear of God because he loved God and he knew that God loved him. Amen. That is what real fear. That's what fear is. And it's not the type of fear like we experience fear. You see, the kind of fear that we talk about, listen up, church, the kind of fear that we understand and talk about drives us away. Human definition of fear drives us away. But the God definition of fear drives us to God. You understand what I'm saying? It drives us to Him. It, drives us, it, it draws us closer to Him when we have the fear of God. The fear that we experience as humans and the fear that God's talking about are two totally different things. One draws away, one draws to and so, who can stand? One day, Judah and Jerusalem will become united once again. One day, there will be an offerings that will be given. Where God, and it's through Christ. It's yourself, guys. The Bible says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, let us offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. See, people don't have no idea. We're not offering ourselves to the Lord. One who serves God is one who offers themselves as a living sacrifice, says Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. We offer ourselves a living sacrifice. John 4, Jesus talks about the woman who talks about who are the true worshipers of God in John chapter 4. Those who worship God in spirit and in truth. In Romans, the Bible says that this is your spiritual act of worship. When you offer your body a living sacrifice. Romans 12, 1. This is your spiritual act of worship. Offering yourself, one who serves God. Not just on Sundays, not just on Wednesday night Bible study, but every day. Who can endure the day of his coming? He's coming, church. He's coming. Those who have an ear can hear the, the horse hoof steps of the, of the apocalypse. The, it's coming. I want you to revive yourself. God is willing, but are you willing, church? Are you willing to awaken that that? That power of God inside of you. Are you willing to turn off all this secular junk that Satan is feeding to America? We're so wrapped up in, in, in reality shows and music contests on, the, on, on TV and such junk and filth that just pollute our minds. We don't have no idea. We, we don't under, we, we couldn't. You can go to the mosque right down the road and they can tell you all about Allah. They could tell you all about the Quran. And there's no truth in it, but they know it. We have the truth, but yet no one could even explain. The, the average Christian could not even explain why they believe in what they believe about. When God has warned us, be prepared in season and out of season. Pastor Claudia came to my attention several, several, several weeks ago that people are forgetting how to write in cursive. Because we're so uneducated. And it came out yes, yesterday that due to autocorrect on our phones, that if we didn't have autocorrect, we won't even, don't even know how to spell. When people have to write letters, there's so many misspelling. We are such an uneducated society today. More importantly, in, even in regards to eternal things like the Word of God. And that's why you're always being attacked and you're losing you have no victory because you don't remember what the word of God says that has to change church that has to change in verse 6 oh well let, let me back up here he says I will come as in the days of old your sacrifice will be pleasing but see verse 5 we have something going on here that he talks about in the nation which we can also find in America he talks about 
I will be a swift witness against sorcerers. You know what sorcery means? If you really break down the word sorcery, some people think it's Harry Potter. And some people think it's playing with, with, with uh, the Ouija board and black magic. And, and it is. But if you really get down to the true meaning of sorcery, it's drug use. It's drugs. The American word, the English word sorcery, translated back into Greek is sorcero. Sorcero is linked to another Greek word, pharmica. And that word pharmica is translated back into English as pharmacy, pharmaceutical. And so it's drugs. Why? Because drugs give you out-of-body experiences. And so therefore, it's sorcery. And today we have the biggest sorcery problem in the world right here in America. Now I'm not saying, you know, if you go and you got to have major surgery and you come out of surgery, don't take painkillers. I'm not saying that. And that there is a, a, a you know, that, that there is medicine out there to help you with things that you're going through, but there's an abuse of it. And then there's the illegal drugs. And that is sorcery. I, b I believe we have that problem in the nation today. And God speaks about the sorcery then. Against adulterers. W what is adultery? We know what adultery means. Let's just basically break it down. Sexual immorality. And that's what's happening in the nation today. It's also what's happening in the church. Even pastors are being exposed. So, so, some of the, uh, more pastors in America have problems with pornography than people in the secular world. Sexual morality is rampant. And this is the worst sin that one could create, that commit sexual morality because it's against your own body. You're uniting yourself with a harlot, says the Lord. And that's why we see even commercials promoting such sexual morality. We see even, we see so, everything on TV, everything on the radio has something, that sexual innuendo to it. Because it's promoting you to get, hmm, and curious about sexual immorality. And eventually you're found in, in adultery, you're found in fornication. And this is the worst kind. It's the worst kind. And against perjurers. You know what perjurer means? Perjury? Lying. When you don't tell the truth. The Bible says, no liar shall enter the kingdom of God. If our, if our life is based on a lie, you know what I'm saying? We're, 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 we need to understand that He is a holy God. And He wants us to be holy because when we confess Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have the testimony of Jesus. We have the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to walk in holiness, to, to be, be hungry for holiness. And that's why churches like this are not filled. There's a lot of holy, holy churches, holiness churches in this land, but they're empty because nobody wants to hear a biblical message today. You know, the true church of Satan teaches that Satan is not an object. Do you know that? The satanic church in America teaches that Satan is not a person, that he's not an object. The satanic church teaches that Satan is removed and that all that we are really at battle with is the enemy. When, when you hear people like, and, and I'm going to say this, and I, I, have a, I believe I have a peace in my heart because you know how I am about speaking about pastors who are preaching a false gospel, but I believe we're so close to the end. But when you have pastors like Joel and Victoria Osteen speaking about, you know, the enemy, the enemy, well, who is the enemy? They never say Satan. They never say the devil. See, because the satanic church teaches that Satan is not an object. That the, the real enemy is just you. When you have fear and doubt and confusion, it's just that that's the enemy. That, that's what they teach. And so therefore, when Victoria Osteen came out a year ago and said, when we come to church, and you can, it's on, it's on the internet, it speaks for itself. When you come to church, you don't worship God for God. You worship God for yourself. So don't just come to church and sing for God. You sing for yourself. You see, that's what the satanic church promotes. The satanic church promotes self-worship. We don't worship Satan. We don't worship a devil because he don't exist. Whatever you think is God, is God.
We can go on and on and on talking about false teachers. They, 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 they are wolves in sheep's clothing. And God was looking at Israel, and God is, looks at the church today, in America today, in the world today, and he says there's sorcerers, there's adulterers, and there's liars. There's people who are lying to you. They're lying to you about what the Bible truly teaches. They take the word of God and they twist it, and they pervert it. They're perjurers. They're lying. What happens if you go to court today and you put your hand on the Bible and you lie? I've had people put their hand on the Bible and lie right to my face. There's forgiveness at the cross. God will forgive you. But do you see how that is real? And God says, I have a, I have a problem against this. Look, against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans. The church is to care for orphans and widows. But yet, in America, we let Medicare take care of that. In church, it's so imbalanced. Some, some are hurting financially in church and others are well off. The, church, the Bible teaches that in the church, that if, if a brother saw another brother in need, they'd make sure that their need was met. But today in America, Christian church in America, oh no, I, I take care of my stuff. I work hard. Yeah, that's true. Those who don't work don't eat. I believe that. That's what the Bible says. If you're lazy, you're not getting nothing. But if you're working hard and you see somebody that's working hard, but they're just having a hard time, but they're trying their best, help them. And one day that person needs to remember that and help someone else. And these orphans and widows, we put them into homes and when the church used to house them. But you see, the church is so imbalanced in money today that we can't even meet the needs of a community today. And also, immigration. The Bible says here, and you, you exploit those who are aliens. Look, we are a nation of immigrants. And I'm not getting political here. I believe that if you want to come to this nation, I believe that there is a way to do it. And you need to get in line. And if we fix the immigration system, that line will move a lot faster. I promise you. But we cannot label every immigrant that comes across as the bad guy. Because we're all a nation of immigrants. And the Bible clearly teaches many times in the Old Testament, do not oppress the foreigners. They're coming to our land for a reason. Yes, there are terrorists trying to sneak in. But if we have a system that's not messed up, we can weed these out. And, you, and I want you to think about this. Watch. This is possible. It is possible. Let me prove my point. Since 9-11, how many terrorist attacks have we had on American soil? We should have had countless. What's happening in France and other parts of the world has, should have been happening here. But we do have a system that is in effect and it is protecting. More importantly, there are men and women of God in those systems that are doing their job right. And I praise God for our military. I praise God for our, our, our FBI. I praise God for them. Some of them don't know the Lord and some of them do. But that's besides the point. I praise God that God has allowed us to live in a country that, that has been blessed. But we are walking away from God. Amen. And if we don't stand up, church, and do something and say something and speak, bring this back into society. We are in deep trouble. Our troubles all began in 1962 when prayer was removed from school. Amen. If you can get the children to stop praying, this is what we have today. People who are in their 50s and 60s, they remember that. People in their 60s, they, knew, they remember when we prayed in school. And you're in your 50s today, that's the generation that grew up not praying in school. And definitely today. We cannot oppress these people. We need to go back to Jesus. Verse 6, for I am the Lord, I do not change. Somebody says, oh, Michael, that's Old Testament. But God says, for I am the Lord, I do not change. He says here, therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Meaning, not just Israel, but the church. You see how Adolf Hitler tried to destroy the Jews? The sons of Jacob is Israel. But do you see how Adolf Hitler tried to destroy all the Jews? It was a plan by Satan putting into the mind and heart of Adolf Hitler. 
He's tried to destroy it, but God saved the remnant of the Jewish people. Do you see that? And you see how this past year, when Benjamin Netanyahu stood up before the entire United Nations, and he says, none of you have come to our aid to help us. And you see how he had a, about a minute, over a minute silence just looking at everybody? Look at that. YouTube it. He says, none of you came to help us. None of you. And there was a, a silence for over a minute. God sees these things. And God is about to reveal himself to Israel. God is about to reveal himself to the church. He says, yet from the days of your fathers, Israel, you have gone away from my ordinances. And even the church, the church fathers, the apostles, they laid a perfect foundation. And what are we building on today? It goes on to say, and you have not kept them. He says, return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? You see, people, people have an attitude when God tells them, you need to come back to me. Has anyone ever experienced that? When, you, when you, you're not living right with God and a brother or sister in Christ tells you, hey, you're not right. The first thing is you have an attitude problem, right? Let's just agree with that. Because, see, that's what they tell God. God says, return to me. And they say, in what way shall we return to you? And God is saying, I've already given you a list of things. But if you really want to get down to what, I, what I'm talking about coming back to me, he speaks to the nation about their money. You see, because money is not the root of evil. It's the root of all kinds of evil, the love of money. People say that money is the root of all evil. No, no, it's the love of money. And so when you love money, you're not one who serves God anymore. What did Christ say about, Jesus, about mammon? He says, you cannot serve God and mammon, money. You'll either serve one and hate the other. And so when you love money, that's the root. Of, the love of money leads someone to deal drugs, to, to, to be a prostitute, to dance topless. To, the love of money allows them to try seek after a career and a lifestyle, to attain, uh, attain things that you only see the Kardashians have. You know what I'm saying? You know, the love of money allows you to be absent from your family while you're seeking a career. The love of money, I mean, we can go on and on about, about how many evils take root from the love of money. Uh, diseases are created by doctors and pharmaceutical companies. Diagnosis, misdiagnoses read in kids are created so that that way they can tell this kid, this is what's wrong with your kid. Put them on this medicine, and that way the pharmacy can make a lot of money, pharmaceutical drugs, when all that kid needed was their parents to teach them and spend time with them. What did you do with your kids 40, 30, 40 years ago when they acted all crazy? They either got a whipping, and they were talked to, and they were prayed over, or you know? But today, parents, they just want to give them a pill because parents are so involved with their own life. And so, because they're focusing on things for the love of money. And so Jesus, I mean, God says here, I'm going to talk to you about what really your problem is. And even into the church today, he says, Will a man rob God, yet you have robbed me? But you say, In what way have we robbed you? And he says, In tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me. Even this whole nation, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that there will not be room enough to contain or to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field. Says the Lord of hosts, for all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Now, some people say this is Old Testament. Some people say, well, you know, this is not nothing to do with the New Testament. God says, the Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. Yes, God loves a cheerful giver. But do you know that tithes and offering was implemented, was practiced before the law of Moses was ever even given by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And even back, even to Cain and Abel. And see, that's why Abel was killed by his brother Cain over the tithe and offering. Before the law of Moses ever was given about the principle of the tithe and offering. And you see, why is it that Cain killed his brother? Why is it that Cain killed his brother? 
Because he was bringing something. As a matter of fact, I'll read it. Genesis 4, verse 3 and 8. It says, And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit to the ground, of the ground to the Lord. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock, meaning the tithe, the very best, the first. The firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel in his offering, but he did not respect Cain in his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. And so the, his attitude, his face, his expression. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why has your countenance falling? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and it desires is for you. But you should rule over sin, said God. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, one day, and it came to pass that when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. See, Cain had a problem with God. But yet he kills his brother Abel. See, a lot of us sometimes have problems with God and we take it out and we, we devour our brothers. That's why Jesus says, the world shall know my disciples by the love they have for one another. Are we our brothers and sisters keepers? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. We are to love one another. Because if we can't even love each other in the church, then we can't even love a world that is vile and corrupt. And so, when you raise your children... All those principles that you teach your children, it begins in your home first, right? And that's the same way it is with the family of God. The Bible says judgment begins in the house of God. We are called the judge which goes on here. I can talk. You can talk. We can talk. If we belong to the body of Christ, we can talk about what's going on, what's wrong in the church. We can talk about these things. And we have to be ready to make, be a solution, have a solution. Ask God for wisdom to make things right. Don't just sit and complain. This is wrong. That's wrong. No, no. But see, this is what was wrong with Israel. And this is what's wrong with the church today. We have a love for money. We're stealing from God. We're not honoring God. God says in verse, when he comes back over here, the verse 6 says, I am the Lord. I do not change. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. He says that this is, you either take this or don't take it. You believe it or you don't believe it. And I know this is going in one ear and out the other with some people. <laughs> you watching. You know, Michael, I just I think that's legalism. No, it's not legalism. You see, a true giver will give more than 10%. But let me tell you something about how this pastor has experienced who cheerful givers are. Cheerful givers give 20, 30% of their income. If you, want to, if you really want to be serious about, oh, well, the New Testament says cheerful givers. A cheerful giver gives 20, 30 percent. That's what a cheerful giver gives. And God's only saying tithe, 10 percent. Why? So that, there may, so that the church may be sustainable. So that we can meet the needs of a community. If, a church, if everyone in the church was faithful in their tithes and offerings, we could help orphans. We could help widows. We can do things that Medicare right now does. We can do. But because we don't sustain the local church worldwide, the church suffers and the work of the church suffers. God doesn't suffer. God doesn't need our money. You know what God wants? Our obedience. And you know how he measures our obedience? By money. And you know why in the wisdom of God, God moved on the hearts of American government to put on money? In God we trust. It's a reminder on American money that when the people of God look at American money, we are to be reminded that this is not our resource, God is. And I, and I know that. Because one day a man woke up and gave, basically to me, $500,000. Never knew this man in my life. And I woke up one day, and he said, here, you can have this, this, year's, this whole place. Here, it's your churches. I believe God is a responsible steward. I don't believe God does things foolishly. I believe God gave this building to this ministry, and we have this place. Why? Because we believe in the principles of the Bible. And I want you to be blessed. But see, God's not going to bless you to how you look, what you wear, what kind of cologne. He's going to bless you how you honor his word in your life. It's one who serves God. I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground and that you will bear fruit. What does that mean? You ever live week to week? Check the check. 
That's the devil. Or number two, it's your foolish planning. You're not budgeting your money. So if we're tithing and we're with wisdom of God budgeting our money, we are guaranteed to not have the devil devouring our finances. Amen. And see, here's the number one thing I want you to understand. He says here, I will open the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that there will not be room enough for you to contain it. Okay, hear this out. When Malachi wrote this, God was talking about the tithe. 400 years later, because see, after this book is over with, we don't hear from God for another 400 years. John the Baptist and Jesus show up. Watch what I'm saying here. When Malachi says this, God's going to open up the windows of heaven if you come back and honor him the way he says to honor him. 400 years later, God's tithe shows up. God's not going to ask you to do something that he will not do himself. God says to tithe because he tithed. You get what I'm saying? See, he says this, and then 400 years later, the windows of heaven opens up, and Jesus came. You get what I'm saying? The Bible says that Jesus is the first fruit. And when we read in Cain and Abel's story that Abel brought the firstborn, the first fruits of his work. Of his livestock. He brought the first fruits, meaning the very best, that was which was unblemished. He brought that to God and God accepted that. And that's who Jesus is. Jesus is God's very best. It's his first fruit. And he is the first fruit of all humanity. And that was God's tithe. And that's why God is saying, This world is going to always have the poor. This world is going to always have people in disease and hunger. But there's a promise that Jesus gives to the church. There's a promise that Jesus gives to the one who serves God. He says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against your church. Now, I'm not saying that every Christian should drive a Lexus and have a nice three-story, two-story brick home. That's not what I'm talking about. But there should be victory in our lives, church. Okay? Eventually, we are going to die of something. But there should be joy and peace and no confusion and no fear in our life, church. Why? Because God has given us these promises for one who serves God that they can walk in victory today. And that when we walk, we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. We walk in the power of Jesus Christ. And the devils, they run from us. Not because, because of us, but because of the one in us, Jesus Christ. And so either we're going to experience that today or we're not going to experience that today. I mean, this is the time, church. This is the time. And so the people say in verse 13, Your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord. But yet you say, what have we spoken against you? God says, you have said it is useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we, we walk as a mourner before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the proud blessed for those who do wickedness are raised up. They even tempt God and go free. What, what, some Christians say this. I have heard Christians say this. It's useless to tithe. It's useless to, to, to go to church and to learn the Bible because, I mean, I, I try to do this and then all of a sudden everything just goes backwards for me. I try to do this right and then the, the the devil just attacks me. I try and to, but look at them. Look at those drug dealers. Look, look at those people that, 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 that they got a big pretty home, but yet they're, that they live like, like the devil. I mean, they're blessed. What am I doing? I'll just forget it. It's, I've heard that. I've heard that. But God is saying, I, 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 I see these things. So the one who truly serves God is not going to look at, you know, here's what happens when you do that. When you get discouraged, hear me out. This is going to speak on many levels, regardless of where you are. When you get discouraged by the way people talk about who Jesus is or how the way they live their lives, and it changes your view of Jesus, that's your fault. Amen. Because you should not let anybody's lifestyle or what they say dictate or alter or change who you think Jesus is. And what I'm talking about that is in a negative way. Okay? That's what I'm talking about. You should not be... You, you, you have the breath of God in you, Christian. And you need to stand up for your Father in heaven. He doesn't need us to. But we are called to be a testimony in a very dark place. I don't care how young, how old you are. If you're alive, you are called. You are loved. You are cherished. There's a, there's a purpose for you. And they were cut to the heart. 
The people of Israel were cut to the heart, and so is the church today. I truly believe, I mean, if you would have asked me back in June, hey, is, are we going to be here by, by January 2016? I would have said, I don't think so. Because when they passed the Supreme Court, passed a ruling about homosexual marriage, and we're not at battle with homosexuals. We're not. We're at battle with the devil. Okay? We need to learn to love people that live in such uh, lifestyles that are against the word of God. We need to learn to love them to the cross. We need to learn to love them and pray for them. Don't look down on them. If you do, you're not a Christian. But we are not entertained by their, their, what they do. We're not entertained by the movies they make. We're not entertained by the conversations they have. But we don't look down on them either. You understand? We need to love them. We need to pray for them. And in God's time, he'll lead us to talk to someone, to lead them to the cross. And you'll be cut to the heart. I believe the church is waking up. I believe the church is cut to the heart. I believe the church is cut to the heart. Verse 16, so were they. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. And the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him. And those who feared the Lord and who meditate on his name. There was a book of remembrance that was written. They wrote down everything that God had done for them. They wrote down all, all the things that were put on their heart about having fear of the Lord, and they meditated on this day and night. Look, this is the book of remembrance right here, church, right here. This is also the book of life, so to speak. Is your name written in the book of life? This is the book of remembrance here. This is what reminds us every day when we go through trials and tribulations that how to get out, how to recover, how to heal. It's here. It's right here. Every Every problem in life, the answer is right here. It's right here. If you study and show yourself an approved worker, you'll know it. It's right here. And it'll become a living word to you then. And not just words on a page like every other book out there. This is the living word. It's the book of remembrance. And so they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. The people that honor that book of remembrance... I'm closing here, I promise. <laughs> they shall be mine, says the Lord. On that day I will make them my jewels, and I will spare them, as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve God. There is coming a day, church, where it will be exposed who serves God and who does not serve God. Who do you serve? And you receive that in Jesus' name.